In order to really understand what is going on in today's world, if you want to truly understand it, we have to go all the way back to Babylon. And we have to take a closer look at their deity, Marduk. When you really understand these two things, then a lot of what is going on today will make sense. The origins of Babylon can be traced back to ancient Mesopotamia, one of the earliest and most influential civilizations in human history during the Sumerian period. Babylon itself became one of the most famous cities in the ancient world. It was known for its cultural, political, and architectural achievements. Now Babylon the Great is a symbolic representation of a system mentioned in the Book of Revelation, which is interpreted as representing a powerful, corrupt, and oppressive system or city. Marduk was the chief god of the ancient city of Babylon and one of the most important deities in the Mesopotamian pantheon. He was associated with the city's political and military success. Throughout the Bible, in the prophetic books, there is a strong condemnation of idolatry, which includes the worship of foreign gods like Marduk. The Israelites were warned against adopting the religious practices of their neighbors, including the Babylonians. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 50, verse 2, Marduk is mentioned by another name, Baal. Announce and proclaim among the nations. Lift up a banner and proclaim it. Keep nothing back but say, Babylon will be captured. Baal will be put to shame. Marduk filled with terror. Her images will be put to shame and her idols filled with terror. Babylon was situated on the Euphrates River in what is now modern-day Iraq, about 50 miles south of Baghdad. Its location in the fertile Mesopotamian plain made it an ideal center for agriculture, trade, as well as political power. The area around Babylon was settled as early as the 3rd millennium BC, and the city began its rise during the Akkadian Empire and years to follow. The earliest references to Babylon appear in texts from the Akkadian period, but it started out as a small, insignificant city compared to other major Mesopotamian cities like Ur and Uruk. Babylon's rise began in the late 19th century BC under the rule of King Sumabum, who established the first dynasty of Babylon around 1894 BC. Later, it was under King Hammurabi from 1792 to 1750 BC that Babylon became the dominant power in Mesopotamia. Hammurabi is probably the most famous early king of Babylon. He is best known for his codes of laws, the Code of Hammurabi. One of the oldest surviving legal codes in history under his rule, Babylon expanded its territory, bringing much of Mesopotamia under its control. Now this code consisted of 282 laws, written in Akkadian cuneiform script. Rules regarding marriage, divorce, inheritance, and the duties of family members. Regulations on the ownership, sale, and leasing of land and property. Laws governing contracts, debts, and the conduct of merchants. Punishments for crimes such as theft, assault, murder, and rules about the treatment of slaves and the responsibilities of masters. One of the most famous principles in the code is the concept of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. This means that punishments were often intended to be equivalent to the offense. 
code also distinguishes between different social classes, including free men, slaves, and property owners. Punishments and penalties could be different depending on the social status of the individuals involved. In some cases, the code assumes the presumption of innocence until proven guilty, with the burden of proof lying with the accuser. Now this is the period when Babylon became a cultural and religious center, and when worship of the god Marduk began to increase. And this is when building ziggurats or step pyramids showcased their architectural achievements. After the fall of the first Babylonian dynasty, the city was ruled by the Kassites, a dynasty that maintained Babylon's status as a cultural and religious center. The Kassites introduced innovations in governance and military organization. In the early first millennium BC, Babylon became under the control of the Assyrian Empire. Then the city experienced a major resurgence under the Neo-Babylonian Empire under King Nebuchadnezzar II from 605 to 562 BC. Now this is the period famous for the construction of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon and the Ishtar Gate, as well as the expansion of the city. In 539 BC, Babylon was conquered by the Persian King Cyrus the Great, marking the end of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. The city became an administrative center within the Persian Empire, and it began to lose its political power. After the conquest of Alexander the Great in the 4th century BC, Babylon became a part of the Hellenistic world. The city eventually fell in ruin over the centuries, especially as the focus of power shifted to other regions. The city's legacy has been preserved in various ways, particularly the Bible, where it is often depicted as a symbol of human pride, idolatry, and opposition to God. The Tower of Babel and the Babylonian captivity of the Israelites are the most well-known biblical references. So Marduk, the chief god of Babylon, was associated with creation, kingship, and order. His origins can be traced back to early Sumerian gods, particularly the god Asalui. Now what's interesting about Asalui he was the god of magic and healing, and he may have also been the god known as Enki, both water gods. I did a video on the Marine Kingdom. If you haven't watched that video, you can find it on my channel page in the search bar. As Babylon grew in power under King Hammurabi, Marduk's status as the chief deity of the city also increased. He became associated with the political and military power of Babylon, and his worship was closely tied to the city's rise as a major power in the ancient Near East. Marduk's most famous mythological story is found in the Babylonian creation epic known as the Enuma Elish. In this epic, Marduk is depicted as the hero who defeats Tiamat, a primordial sea goddess who represents chaos. After slaying Tiamat, Marduk uses her body to create the world, establishing order out of chaos. Following his victory over Tiamat, Marduk is proclaimed the king of the gods. He is given control over the Tablet of Destinies, a powerful symbol of authority, and becomes the supreme deity in the Mesopotamian pantheon. Marduk is often depicted with his symbolic animals, the dragon and a bull, representing his power and authority. He is also associated with the spade, a tool used in the construction of canals, reflecting his role as a creator and builder. Remember that builder part. The most famous temple dedicated to Marduk was the Isagala in Babylon which included the Entomenaki, a massive ziggurat often associated with the biblical Tower of Babel. And I believe that reached a height of about 600 feet. But of course, according to the biblical story, 
they never finished building it. This temple was the center of Marduk's worship and a symbol of Babylon's religious and political power. Now, these gods never really go away. They just go by different names depending on the culture. In Egypt, Marduk was probably the god they knew as Ra. And when you look at the similarities between them, you'll understand why. Now this comes from the book of Revelation chapter 17. Listen to this. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will shew into thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Where, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was, is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. There goes the seven mountains again. I just did a video on Antarctica. You should watch that video. I mentioned seven mountains in that video. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was, and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Now keep in mind, folks, that whenever a beast is mentioned in the Bible, they are usually talking about a large ruminant land animal, such as a horse or a cow or bull. That is why these things usually have horns. And one of the reasons why bulls and cows were considered sacred or worshipped by these ancient people, and some people still consider them sacred. Marduk was associated with the bull in Babylon, and he was also depicted with sun symbolism. Ra in Egypt was also depicted with sun symbolism, but he was connected to Hathor, who was depicted using symbolism of a cow. Now the sun and the bull, or cow, are important here. Because later, when Moses leads the Israelites into the wilderness and leaves them to ascend Mount Sinai, 
they melt their gold and start worshiping what? A golden calf. And of course, that came from Egyptian influence. Now, who else is represented by a bull that God told his people not to worship? Moloch. In Leviticus, it reads, you shall not give any of your children to offer them to Moloch and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord which explicitly forbids the offering of children to Moloch or sacrificing their children. In Leviticus, it also says, say to the people of Israel, any one of the people of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel, who gives any of his children to Moloch shall surely be put to death. I myself will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people. This really relays the severity of the practice with harsh penalties for those who engage in it. And in Jeremiah, it reads, they built the high places of Baal in the valley of the son of Hena to offer up their sons and daughters to Moloch, though I did not command them, nor did it enter my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Moloch and Baal are both associated with bull imagery. So, either all these deities are under the same top hierarchy of Satan, or they are all in cahoots with each other. So in the next video, or in the video after the next, I'm going to talk about what this all has to do with another topic that was requested, by the way, the Babylonian Talmud the Rothschilds. And then we'll move into the topic of targeted individuals. I just wanted to lay down this foundation for you so that when I do discuss those topics, you'll have a clearer picture of what is being addressed. Anyway, that's all for now, and there is more to come. I do have a recommended video for the day. Watch that video. It will be linked on screen at the top right corner of this video and in the description box and pinned comment below. Please hit the thumbs up button to help with the algorithms. You can also find me on Instagram at jwoodward. Check out my other links in the description box. Also, leave a comment and subscribe so you don't miss the next video. Everyone have a great day. Take care, folks. And as always, friends, stay awake, stay aware, stay safe, and I'll talk to you all soon. Every minute of every day, your body heals, repairs, and regenerates you from the inside out. Yet everyday exposure to heavy metals and toxins builds up and blocks your body's natural abilities. Natural zeolite is nature's answer to our toxic body burden. Breakthrough sound wave technology creates the world's first colloidal zeolite. Touchtone essentials Pure Body Extra Colloidal Zeolite helps clean out the chemicals from the body with an easy to use spray so you can make room for healthy in your life. Click the link in the description box below to order your supply of Zeolite today. Because now is the time to live your best life.